it's definitely winter here at the Garden Home, and we're exploring ways to celebrate the season both inside and outdoors. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to the Garden Home. Well, it doesn't happen very often, but here in the midst of getting ready for the holidays, we got this beautiful snow last night. In today's show, we're going to talk about some great ways to celebrate the holidays. You know, the winter is a beautiful time of year to enjoy the garden. Today, we're going to take a walk around the farm. Believe it or not, winter's the best time of year to view the structure of the garden. With all the flowers and foliage dormant, it's easy to see the bones of the design. We'll also visit a few of my feathered friends and see how they're coping with all of this white stuff. You see, it's the first snow they've seen. Plus, an expert on historical fireplaces gives me a history lesson about this unique and time-honored design. And the winter is in full force, so I'm having the house double-checked for energy efficiency. Then along with a trip to a local Christmas tree farm, we'll check out our new gate that I'm having made for the Rose Garden. Well, you can see we have a lot to cover in today's show. It's a little cold out here. I want to take you inside and just give you a quick run through the house because we did something interesting this year. We used a very different color, the color orange in our decorating. So come on in. I enjoy decorating for Christmas, especially with items you typically don't think about decorating with. Last Christmas, I used a lot of brown items with a natural look to them, but this year I felt like a little color was necessary. So I used clementines, you know, those tangerine-like fruits, and I use them in various places throughout the house to give off a nice vibrant pop of color. For instance, adding a few to this centerpiece really enhances the elegance of the setting. I also use quite a few on my mantle in tall, clear vases. And in the entryway, I filled three large punch bowls with these little orange beauties. Orange is not a traditional color for the Christmas season, but hey, it worked out beautifully with my home decor. At one time, Rumford fireboxes were very popular in this country, back when people heated their homes with fireplaces. In fact, Thomas Jefferson built Rumfords at Monticello. Today, the legendary heating efficiency of the Rumford is attractive to those who are building energy efficient homes and are concerned about their air quality. Jim Buckley, an expert on historic fireplace design, tells us the story of the Rumford firebox and explains the technology that makes this firebox still relevant today. Well, come on, Jim, get in and out of the cold here. I wanna show you this firebox. This is one of the tallest ones we have, have here tallest Rumford. I see you got a TP fire built in. Well, yeah. It, do you think these actually help help the fireplace draw better? Yes, I think it's so tall you need to get the smoke up the back so it burns up. A lot of people come to visit here and, and they ask me about the Rumford and uh, they want to know exactly what makes it work so well and honestly I don't completely understand the thermodynamics that go on here. These fireplaces were designed to heat so they're shallow and reflective so the radiant heat is maximized. And I'm feeling it today. <laughs> it's warm enough. And then they have a, an airfoil throat or a rounded throat like an airplane wing so that it takes just a little bit of air to carry away the smoke. Not too much or it's inefficient. So that's the whole secret of a Rumford. Really? Maximum radiant I heat, see. minimum air loss. Rumfords tend to be taller than modern fireplaces. They tend to be square. So if this is four feet wide, it would tend to be four feet tall. Right, yeah. And I think that's pretty much like the ones you have in the main house that are square. Modern fireplaces tend to be much lower because they don't have the airfoil throat and they don't tend to draw as well. So you can make any fireplace draw better by making it lower, which is why a modern fireplace is deep and low. I didn't have to heat with modern fireplaces. They had central heating in 1950. Now, Jim, in this world where we're very concerned about the environment and, and energy efficiency, this old idea really is, is sort of new and, and appropriate again, isn't it? Well, it does seem to come around again. Um, a lot of people didn't think you could burn clean 
or efficiently in an open fire. And we've shown that to be wrong. Uh, we've tested this now for uh, e emerging EPA emission standards, and it's cleaner than an EPA wood stove, which is kind of amazing. So the smoke in this TP fire, it's pulled into the fire, and it's in the fire a long time. I call that residency time. So the longer you can keep the smoke in the fire, the more of it burns up. And if you went outside, you wouldn't see any smoke coming out of the chimney. So you get more heat in the house, less lost air out of the house. It's a very efficient radiant heater. Now let's put a screen up. We want to be yeah. safe when we're well, not we here. screens around here for sure. If you'll take that side. Here we go. Okay. Now this blocks some of the heat, unfortunately, but if we're not going to be here, it'll... Well, I think it's putting out plenty of heat. Come on, let's head over to the other place. <laughs> Andrea Inglesby is a certified home energy rater. She was recently here performing a few tests to check on the energy efficiency of the building. She explains to us what she looks for when she's rating a home. Well, today we're doing the final phase of a certified rating, which is the performance testing uh, using the blower door and the duct blaster. Uh, we test how leaky the house is, the envelope of the house. We test how leaky the ductwork is. When we show up at the house to do the blower door test, we have a sort of custom fitting frame uh, that we put in an exterior door and a fan fits in this door frame. We can tell it to suck the air out of the house, depressurize the house, or we can have it pressurize the house, whichever way we want it to go. Kind of depends on some of the different testing that we do. As we depressurize the house, we're saying, keep the house depressurized to a certain point. Well, if the house was completely airtight, the fan would bring the house down to that pressure and it would shut off because it had done its job and no air leakage would be coming in. But because all houses leak, they're not airtight, that fan has to continually spin to keep the house depressurized. So the leakier the house, the harder the fan has to work. Our general rule of thumb is that we're looking for one cubic foot per minute of air, that's air leakage, finding its way into the house per one square foot. And if it's over that, we know we've got some problems. The things that people can do that stops their house from being so, so leaky is looking at the weather stripping. Sometimes doors warp or they don't, uh, close very well and ha having some door adjustments or just making sure the weather stripping's there and you can't see daylight. Uh, you know, same thing with windows. If a window is loose in there, it can be leaking. Doing an energy rating process and doing this uh, Energy Star qualification, we try and stop as much of that from happening. <music> Wow, Stuart, I cannot believe the size of this thing. It's colossal. <laughs> yeah, this is quite a piece, really I'm, nice antique piece. It's amazing. Well, you know, the, the old part and the new part are, are, are wedded so beautifully, I can't tell where the old part stopped and the new part begins. I've used the same techniques uh, with the fabrication that I've done on this crest that uh, the blacksmith who did the original work used, and that's the reason it appears to be of the same age. If you look closely at the original piece, you'll see a certain uh, texture that denotes uh, yeah. you know, a handcrafted, yeah, hand hammered. forged. Ham mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, you'll see the hammer strikes, you'll see uh, where the hot mill scale has been mm -hmm. pounded into the hot steel. This piece uh, predates electronic welding, so all the means of joinery are mechanical with uh, rivets in this case. Uh, if you look closely, you'll see scarf welds. These are actual uh, forge weld uh, locations where they've heated two pieces of metal to uh, forge temperature and then hammered them together. Oh, I see. So it wetted them while they're hot. Right. Yeah. You'll see, see. You'll see that here and here. You know, when I found this piece years ago, it felt to me that it looked as though it came from maybe the first quarter of the 19th century, maybe up to about 1840 or 18, 1850. 
and I was really taken by the fact that it has these lead finials. I thought that was kind of odd. Yeah, I haven't come across this before. I think that's kind of unusual. Uh, obviously with the lead, it's easier to work with than steel. It has a lower melting point. It's more malleable. Yeah. And so it's probably a, a cruder way of uh, creating a, a finial. Yeah. It's really remarkable uh, the, the, the sort of the heat and strength that has to go into uh, twisting the, this metal into, mm. into these various shapes yeah. and beautiful forms. And, and I noticed that there's a mark up there that, that you just said you discovered in, in kind of cleaning this up. Yeah, this is the uh, blacksmith's signature. It's called a touch mark. And that's, touch the way, mark. that's the way he signed his work. Well, I can't wait to see it go up on top of the gate. I'm excited as well. I think we're about ready to get going with that. So uh, let's, let's get started. Okay. I think that looks good. I just can't believe how close the, the, the old looks to, to the new. I mean, it's just, it's so amazing the finish on here, Stuart. Yeah, what I've done with the finish there, Alan, I've uh, basically taken everything down to the bare metal and then applied a chemical uh, patina that oxidizes and blackens the steel and then clear coated it. And the clear coat will keep it from rusting? Yeah, the, the clear coat, Alan, uh, does help protect it. it. It will rust a little bit, and I think that a little bit of rust is a positive. It, it, it's part of the vernacular of the materials. Yeah, it'll fe feel like this old garden. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's really, really quite colossal. So, Stuart, what's the next step here? I, I guess you're going to have to attach the, the crest or the bonnet. That is the next step. We're going to uh, plumb and level the bonnet and weld it into place. Exciting. Yeah. Very good. And then, and then you'll take the gates back to uh, your studio and, and work on right. them. Right. Yeah, there's, there's uh, more components to get added to the gates. So Wonderful. Go finish those out. Well, it's just, just amazing. I, your craftsmanship is extraordinary. I, I'm going to get out of the way and let you get to work. Okay, thanks, <laughs> Alan. Thank you. Have you ever struggled with the question of getting a real or artificial Christmas tree? Artificial trees seem easy, but there's so many more reasons to go for a real tree. Randy Motley is the owner of a local Christmas tree farm near my farm and he tells us about the advantages of real live Christmas trees. Out here, all the trees are still growing in a the field. They're all gonna be fresh cut. So the only thing really you have to be looking for is a tree that looks the best to you. And on a Christmas tree farm, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So whatever tree looks right for you is gonna be the right tree. Uh, all these trees, since they are fresh growing trees, uh, they're all gonna last well past Christmas. We grow Virginia pine, which is the first tree we started out with. About 25 years ago, Virginia pine was the only tree uh, thought to be producible in Arkansas on a, uh, commercially. The Virginia pine, it's a little bit difficult to make a Christmas tree out of it. It has to be forced into a Christmas tree shape through a, a lot of handwork, pruning, and trimming. Uh, about 15 years ago, we started growing Leyland cypress, and it has kind of become the new Christmas tree of the South. Leyland cypress is also trimmed several times a year, but it has more of a candle flame shape just naturally. So it's a much easier tree for us to make into a Christmas tree with the minimum amount of shearing and trimming. We also grow Carolina sapphire, which is a Arizona cypress. Carolina sapphire is a new tree for us. Uh, it seems to be a drought hardy uh, tree, so it's working well for us on our farm in areas that we can't irrigate. It has kind of a, a bluish gray look, uh, a very aromatic smell, Christmas tree smell. Eastern red cedar is just the traditional old fashioned Christmas tree that people did used to go out and cut out of the woods. Uh, we grow a small amount of those just for the demand. We do them. Um, uh, like our other Christmas trees. We shear our eastern red cedar and after they've been sheared and fertilized in a production setting, they're much, much fuller and thicker than a regular eastern red cedar in the woods. It's an advantage to the environment to use a real tree versus an artificial tree. Uh, the real tree farms are making use of land that is, a lot of times it's marginal land that is not going to be used for another crop. Uh, we can take we can use marginal land and make a Christmas tree farm on it. 
we have enough trees on this farm to supply oxygen for 40 people a year. They, that's how it figures out. So we think it's a good thing to have, uh, to use a live Christmas tree. They are a renewable resource, as opposed to the artificial tree that is uh, usually plastic, petroleum based. It's just much better for the uh, environment to use a real tree. Uh, there's approximately 35 million live Christmas trees used each year. That's a lot of trees in production that would not be there if it weren't for people using live Christmas trees in their house. You know, it's really marvelous when a landscape is covered with a beautiful blanket of snow. It tends to erase all the distractions of color and movement and so forth. And what you begin to see really are the bones and the framework of a garden. It's often been said that the best time to see a garden is in the winter. And then you can really judge whether it holds up or not. If it holds up in the winter, then it's likely to be a good garden in all four seasons. And you see that structure makes such a difference in a garden, particularly this time of year when it's so cold and barren. Structural plants such as specimen trees, shrubs and hedges, and really even grasses take a step forward and you really begin to see their importance in creating strength in a garden's design. And then there are the man-made structures, for instance, walls and, and structures like these uh, vertical supports or tutors uh, that we've painted that sort of soft comfort green. And then the octagon buildings here in this garden, they serve as sentinels or punctuation points along these garden terraces. And even containers, the way the snow mounds on them take on a different form. And the arbors here that we walk under during the spring and summer, that are so beautifully flowered on either side and covered with vines, whether they're grapes or gourds, take on an entirely different look. You see, this is a wonderful time of year to walk around your garden and assess where you think it needs strength. So just by going around, taking a look, making some photographs and a few notes, it'll put you in good stead for the growing season to come. This particular breed is called a silver laced wine dot. They were developed in the 19th century. And even though they're a little skittish today about getting out here in the snow, they were actually bred for cold weather. They came from upstate New York. Come here, girl. <laughs> just look at the beautiful feather patterning on them. I just think they're ab absolutely exquisite birds. And they have a comb, which is called a rose comb, which is very short and low to the head, which prevents the comb from freezing. With other breeds, you have a tall single comb that can freeze when temperatures drop into the teens or even below zero. But with this rose comb, it stays close to the head and rarely freezes. Now, take a look at this one. This is, the actual, this is a cockerel. The other one was a pullet. All these are pullets and cockerels, meaning they're all under one year of age. And uh, what I love about these birds is this lacing, hence the name Silver Laced Wyandot. And, um, what we'll do is when we get a little closer to spring, we'll pick out the best pullets and the best cockerels, and uh, we'll put them aside. And we'll gather eggs from those and we'll put them in the hatchery, in the hatcher. And in 21 days, once they're set, the eggs will hatch into little chicks. We'll have the next generation of silver laced wine dots. This is a dual purpose breed, uh, considered an American breed, and they're good both for egg production and for their meat. They're, they're nice and full and heavy birds. They lay a beautiful brown egg. Now, of course, you wouldn't need this many for a backyard flock, but this is a great breed because they're, they're very gentle. You see, they're a little spooked by me, but they're, uh, they're moving out. Okay, go on, girl. I think they're more afraid of the snow than they are of me, but they're, they're a great dual purpose, gentle breed. Just a few hens to have in your backyard. Well, they'd supply you with all the fresh eggs you could eat.
Well, I'm here in my design studio. It's one of my favorite things to do, to look at gardens, do drawings, and take photographs that you send to me. We play around with some ideas to improve the house or the landscape. Now today we've got a beautiful Victorian reproduction. It belongs to Matthew in Ohio. It looks like they've done an excellent job on the house. Now one of the things I always look at from the very beginning is how do you divide space? You've got this wonderful barn over here, another barn here. There's some playground equipment over here to the left. So let's think about sort of framing this house where you might have a sense of a garden room in the front. So what I want to do is I want to start with this idea of maybe creating a hedge that would run along here and it could be in U, a U hedge, and then maybe the same hedge could come off the side of the porch, maybe back here where the house begins and run across here where eventually it might screen some of the playground equipment. And you can see how a dark green hedge would already begin to frame the house. And then I want you to think about the idea of using a punctuation plant here, one here, one here on this corner, and one here. And these could be something traditional. I think you want to do that because this house reflects the 1870s, 80s, or 90s, very Victorian. And then let's think about other structural components here um, in the way of plants. Weeping trees were very popular among the Victorians. And so what you could do here to further frame, because you have these trees over here, one thing we could do on this side is to add some kind of weeping tree, which would be very nice. Um, I would encourage you to maybe try a weeping willow or a weeping cherry would be beautiful. And you could even bring a weeping cherry up here on this side to sort of frame it. I think weeping cherries would be beautiful. And then here across the front of a house, uh, I want to talk to you about a picket fence, but first let's finish out the foundation planting. I think there's room here to maybe do some roses, uh, some knockout roses here would be very good uh, with your yews, your evergreens there. And then as a ground cover, why don't you think about using something like Virginia creeper? It's very tough and very easy to grow. In fact, you could use that as a foundation plant at the base of the yews there. And then across the front, let's think about this. Um, I would really like to see a picket fence that maybe comes from here across the front, which gives you some bed space on the other side. So you would take up um, all of this turf here, and that would be a flower border that you would see when you come out of the house. And then this picket fence would come along here. It could just be a section of picket fence. It would come along here like this. Again, creating this courtyard area, which would add so much charm. And the fence could come all the way down to a point here. You could do another cluster of those U's that we talked about on either end. And then on this, you could do a climbing rose, you could do climbing clematis, or a wonderful uh, scarlet honeysuckle. All of these would be period plants that would reflect the ethos of this house. Beautiful job on the house. Love to see this all complete. Congratulations, and I hope this helps. That's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. As we've seen, there's so many different and fun ways to bring in the holiday season. Wishing you and yours all the best in the holiday season. From the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.